welcome to Annabel Taylor Chapel at Cornell University and to the spectacular Cornell Baroque organ which you see behind me. The instrument was completed in 2011 at the end of a 10-year research project that was undertaken between Cornell and the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. We were working with Munetaka Yokota, the great Japanese organ builder, who was overseeing the project at GoArt, the Gothenburg Organ Art Center. We also worked with the local organ company Parsons Pipe Organ Builders in Bristol, New York, who created the wind system and the action of this instrument, and with local master woodworker Chris Lowe, working alongside Pete DeBoer, who created the gorgeous organ case. The instrument was based on an instrument that had been destroyed in Berlin in the Second World War. It was an organ built for the court chapel at Schloss Charlottenburg in Berlin in 1706 by the master organ builder then thought of as the greatest organ builder in Europe, Arp Schnitger. Why did we choose that instrument to use as the model for this one? Well, we wanted to try to create an organ on which we could play the great repertoire of the North German music of the 17th century, think Dietrich Buxtehude, but we also wanted to be able to play 18th century organ music and obviously the great uh, repertoire of Johann Sebastian Bach. Now those two organ worlds in the period are actually very different. The great North German organs are quite dissimilar from the organs that you find in central Germany that Johann Sebastian Bach would have known and played. Not that he didn't also very much admire the North German style instruments too. But in Charlottenburg in 1706, Arpschnecker created an instrument that was, in retrospect, enigmatic and quite strange for the time. It's an instrument that seems to combine those North German characteristics, especially with a large pedal division, and the sounds of the central German organ. That seemed like the ideal instrument for this chapel, partly because the chapel in Charlottenburg where that instrument was built is of fairly similar dimensions to this one here. And it was a chapel that wasn't really used for great religious ceremonies, but for many, many different kinds of music making. The thing that we tried to do when we, when we built this instrument was to copy not so much the exact dimensions of that instrument, which had been put in a very strange architectural setting, but the sounds and the sound world. The instrument had been taken out of its case in the 1930s and removed to the basement of the very large castle in the center of Berlin, the Stadtschloss. Tragically, in that castle, the instrument was in fact destroyed by bombing. But in the process of it taking out, it had been documented very carefully. And from those documents, we were able to see what it consisted of, how the pipes were made, you know, very many details of its construction. And from those, we created this instrument here, using as far as possible the materials and the handwork techniques of the period. So what we've created is an instrument that sounds and feels very, very much like what musicians at the beginning of the 18th century would have heard and what they would have touched as they played. It's in a case which is actually not the same as the one in Charlottenburg. Given the very cramped dimensions there, we decided to create something that fit better into the architecture of this space. And we used as our model the organ also by Abschnittger at Klaus Tart Zellerfeld in the Hartz Mountains, built around the same time. That is the instrument that has lent us this extremely beautiful physical prospect. We're going to take you through the instrument today and give you a few detailed insights into how it works and into what's hiding inside those cases and tell you a little bit more about the story of its construction. And I have with me here Matthew Hall, keyboardist extraordinaire, PhD from Cornell, and organist of great uh, talent and insight who's going to tell us a little bit more about the instrument, who's going to demonstrate for us, and who's going to begin by saying a little bit about this beautiful case. So as Annette mentioned, this case is uh, not based on the Berlin organ, but on the Zellerfeld Schnittger organ. 
And what we have here is what's called a Werkprinzip design. So that means basically the, the divisional principle is what that means. And this is an organ of three divisions or departments, if you like, three organs in one. So that's two manuals with pedal. And each of those divisions or departments are uh, disposed disparately in the architecture of the case. So what we have at the very top between the two prominent towers is the Hauptwerk, or the main division. The two towers on either side, those are the great pedal towers, so those are the pipe, in, in those two towers respectively are the pipes controlled by the feet. And then at the very front, sort of jutting out, is the Rückpositiv, or the, um, the organ that is placed behind, is really what that means. And it's behind the organist who sits uh, between uh, that jutting out division and the rest of the case behind. We can see in this beautiful case, uh, you know, Chris Pine's work, uh, excuse me, Chris Lowe. Chris Lowe's work is um, really wonderful. We can see that each of the frontals, that is to say the places where the pipes are seen, is delicately ornamented with moldings, each of which were made by hand. Chris had to make um, molding planes. Um, you know, basically cut a particular knife for each of those particular profiles, set it in a block, and then rub, you know, sharpen that knife, and then rub uh, that block across the um, oak for each of those. And each of those um, components of those, you know, big, thick crown moldings, I mean, that's maybe, I, I can sort of count off the top of my head, maybe eight or ten knives to make that, those moldings. And note also the shades, those are the sort of, um, the, the sort of uh, leaf motif um, that uh, sort of enclose the shades. That's to give um, a, a neat finish because not all the pipes are the same length, obviously. Um, so the shades sort of track the natural contour of the pipes. Last of all, I'd like to point out just at the very, very top, above the Hauptwerk case, underneath the uh, arch of the roof, we see those four uh, vertical structures, sort of like suspenders coming down from the, from the heavens. Those are the wind trunks. That's where the wind comes from, from um, up behind the arch in the tower of the chapel. And that's where we're gonna go next. So this is the entrance to the organ gallery, but we're going to go on past up to the fellows room, which is way up at the top here. And there we're going to see why it is this organ has this very special wind system, how that functions, and, and I guess how we create this wonderfully fluctuating living right. sense of wind in this instrument. Yeah, so the wind, I mean, in, prin in principle can be generated by a human person trading the bellows, as we'll see. Um, and, but even with the electric blower, it remains totally flexible, and even, to a certain degree, under the control of the player when playing. That's right. So here we go into the bellows room. So here we are with this fantastic box that contains the four multifold bellows of this instrument. Now, of course, the instrument can, of course, be, be made to live with wind created by a machine. So the blower here creates the wind that passes through the bellows, comes up through these conductors into the bellows, and from there it comes out through these wooden conductors and then is fed down back into the chapel and down into the instrument itself. Of course, the organ can be supplied with an electric blower, but it can also be supplied completely on human power, that is, uh, completely without electricity. So that, of course, requires a human, and I will be the human. Um, so the treader, or the pumper, or the calcult, stands up here, holds on for dear life, and waits for the signal. There's the signal of the calcult bell, so that's my signal to start pumping. Now, each of these treadles uh, is connected to one of 
the bellows, and they are so massed such that by the time I tread the last one, the first one needs treading again. So now the organ is supplied with wind, and the organist may begin to play. And you notice now that she's playing, the wind, they need faster treading. And that's obvious because the wind is escaping from the organ through the pipes. Now this I might use to follow along in the music and sort of anticipate when I need to tread faster if loud music is coming, or I can tread a bit slower and take a breather because soft music is coming requiring less wind. So here we are coming down from the bellows room in the tower and going into the gallery. Now, of course, your average pumper in the 18th century would never be permitted to come into the gallery unless perhaps he was an advanced apprentice, but never mind. And here you can see the, the wind trunk coming down from the tower, carrying the wind down. It's even hissing just very slightly. Uh, the wind is coming down through here, and it's going in, actually it's being conducted through wooden conductors now under the floor, which bring it into the wind chest, in this case, in the pedal tower. You can see here this oak box, which is sealed heavily with these iron clasps and lined with leather to make it airtight. And the air is sitting in there. The pipes are sitting on top of this box. And uh, we'll talk in a little while about how the wind is allowed to get into the pipes or kept out from the pipes. But one thing you can see to notice right here is the reed pipes which sit on the back of the chest because there they can be tuned easily and if you look closely you can see here the little tuning wires that allow the resonators of the reeds to be made a little longer or a little shorter in order to bring them into tune with the rest of the organ. This is the two foot reed on the pedal that we're seeing right at the back here of the chest. So if we go over this way we will head uh, towards, well, this is one of the entrances into the console area. There's another one there. But we're going to go past the console and head up instead to the upper level of the organ to have a look inside the Hauptwerk chest. I'll just mention uh, on our way up that what we have here is we have a, a, these are those trunks again coming down, these conductors coming down from the bellows room. And what we have here is we have a baffle. There are several in various places, but this one is uh, most clearly seen. A baffle that allows the wind to communicate between different departments of the organ. Now, ordinarily, each department of the organ is winded independently, which means that the wind is not only flexible, but independently flexible, more or less flexible in different departments. By drawing the baffle out, we can allow wind to sort of uh, move freely between different departments of the organ, and that allows, this is sort of a unique feature of this organ, that allows this organ to sort of um, imitate the winding designs of a lot of different organs from different periods. Here we are in the upper level of the organ. You can see the conductors bringing the wind down from the tower, along the back wall, and here into the Hauptwerk case. When we look in here with this forest of pipes, you can see that really what the organ is, is simply a great box of whistles. Yeah, and there are many more whistles than we can see in just, just one um, uh, corner of the Hauptwerk. But um, this, uh, we can sort of get a sense of the whole from this little corner. So what we have in the facade, visible from the outside of the case, these pipes here, that's the eight-foot principle. These big pipes here, that's the 16-foot Quintadina, stopped, as you can see, uh, sort of a large flute scale, but stopped, and the, the way the mouth is formed is a principle. Um, and we can see the beautiful hand soldering. Each pipe is made by hand here. This is the uh, eight-foot uh, eight foot flute douce, beautiful stop, we'll hear in a moment. The four-foot octave, the eight-foot gedacht stop, Notice that uh, the four-foot octave and the eight-foot gedacht are of the same, or an octave apart. This is an octave lower than that, but that's accomplished because this one's stopped and this one's open. The physical property there. Um, this is the four-foot Spitzflöte in the conical form. Uh, this very interesting pipe. The, notice the extreme conical form of the four-foot uh, viola da gamba Spitzflöte form. This is the three-foot nasat, a flute scale. This is a very interesting pipe. This is the two-foot super octave, and despite the name, it's not a principle at all, as you can see. It's a flute of Gems Gemshorn form, chimney flute form. 
This we have here is the mixture of five or six uh, ranks or number of pipes per note, uh, depending on the, on the particular range. And at the front, we have the reeds, at the back, or rather at the back, I should say. Uh, we have the reeds um, at this position to make them easy to tune. They go out of tune uh, more regularly than the others. What's interesting here is that this pipe and that pipe, for instance, are exactly the same pitch. And that might be surprising just looking at the size of the external uh, resonator. But on a reed pipe, unlike the flues through which wind passes and, and the column of air vibrates, the pitch of these reed pipes is determined by the length of the reed and the sort of the, the properties of the reed. Um, the re resonator, the length of the resonator, determines the timbre, not the pitch. So these trumpet resonators are so-called full-length resonators. They produce a boring, fundamental, rich, uh, full sound. And the fractional resonators uh, of the uh, Vox Humana produce, um, they sort of dampen down the fundamental and then let the other harmonics, the higher harmonics, shine in the timbre, creating a kind of nasal or more characterful sound. Now, as I've been naming the different stops, I've been naming them, you've noticed, in rows. Those rows are what we call ranks. But I've also mentioned that pitches of the same, sorry, pipes of the same pitch, now I direct your attention down into the case where you can see they are in a perfectly straight line. So the pipes are organized very um, precisely in a rank-wise or in rows, but also in columns according to pitch. And the ranks are controlled by the stop action, and the columns are controlled by the key action. Okay, here we are coming into the key desk area. This is where the organist obviously sits and plays from. And from this perspective, we can get a uh, different uh, close-up view of some of the details of the case that I was pointing out from below. Uh, first thing to perhaps notice is the extreme angle of uh, the, the frontals here. Um, that angle uh, obviously doesn't read so sharply from uh, downstairs, but if it were any shallower, it wouldn't read as an angle at all from downstairs. We can also see, again, the, the beautiful bull noses and the coves and the ogees and so forth. Again, those are massive, and they don't sort of don't look right from this close, but they're not meant to be viewed from this close. They're meant to be viewed from downstairs, and at that distance, they, they work perfectly. The other uh, thing that uh, the organist can see that uh, those downstairs perhaps can't is that the pipe shades are not carved. They're painted in, uh, uh, in trompe l'oeil. Um, and even after you know that they're trompe l'oeil shades, um, they still read as carved shades from downstairs, which I think is a, a sign of the mastery of the workmanship. And indeed, there's ornamentation at every sort of level of this organ, uh, both at the 40-foot level, but also at the 4-foot level. So there is ornamentation that is meant to be viewed only by the organist and perhaps his or her assistant, um, and that's, you know, details like these beautiful this beautiful cornice here, which is not visible from downstairs, and is really for the enjoyment of the organist. Notice that the moldings are in their correct proportion for being viewed at a close distance. It's like a beautiful secret world up here at this instrument, with the fantastic carved stop knobs, you see all the details, the bone decoration on them, heavy levers, which we'll talk about in a second, and the beautiful blue and gold stop labels you see here, Prussian blue, a colour invented in 18th century Berlin with lapis lazuli ground in to the paint to create this gorgeous colour. Um, you can see the, the beautiful uh, wood and bone keys. You can see the pedals here, of course, all the beautiful small decorations. One of the other things that one notices close up is the extraordinary flaming on the cortisol oak. And the fantastically beautiful marquetry on the key desk. The key desk was made in Switzerland, uh, sorry, in Sweden. And of course, all the rest of the, the carving that you see was made here locally. Um, 
a beautiful example of marquetry, again, just for the enjoyment of the organist themselves. And this copies very much what was in Berlin. But if we take this off, see the hind, we can start to see the secret innards of the instrument and you can see the action. So inside here, you can see the action of the instrument. It looks complicated to some extent. It is a, a complicated system of many moving parts. At the same time, it's also very simple. Everything is mechanical. You see everything is made of wood, of oak, of iron, of brass, we have twine. Um, it's, a, it's a system that would, would have been absolutely the same in an organ of the early 18th century. And how does it work? Well, press the keys, no sound. What you have to do is pull out the stop. The sound is being stopped from sounding by two valves in the instrument. The first is the slider that runs underneath the complete ranks of pipes as they run horizontally. So pipes of a particular timbre are all stopped from sounding by a slider. Pull the stop and the air can enter. But until, for that air to enter, a key has to be depressed. And at that point, a valve at the bottom of the individual pipes opens and the air can go in. No stop. Pull the stop and the pipe sounds. So the wonderful thing about this organ really is what it's like to play. Um, all that uh, iron and leather and brass, um, there was a lot of play in the action as, as we could see when the, when the desk was off, but it's precisely that play that gives it its responsiveness, responsiveness to the organist's touch, but also responsiveness to the action as it's working, which then transmits information back to the organist through the action itself. So what we can do is we can control both the speed of the opening and particularly the closing of the valve uh, because of this wonderful action. So maybe we can just start by listening to the principles. Uh, it's always a good place to start. Here's the principle of the Hauptwerk. Beautiful. Should we hear the trumpet on the top there? That's a very particularly beautiful reed. that with the very beautiful Roxamana sure. on the Hauptwerk um, that's with the alone and then we can add the eight foot flute to it beautiful 
spot. Why didn't so we can hear that wonderful nasal quality? Yes. Why did we add the eight foot flute on the on the um, yes on the help? That's good. And then maybe we could use it as a solo stop. The organ yes. in Berlin is famous for this most beautiful solo box piano. Maybe add the tremulant as well. Yes, that's a good idea. So. Well, for, some, for another of my favorite, most beautiful stops, I would say it's the flout deuce, on the, oh, yes. the eight foot flout deuce on the harp. So actually, listen to that a little. Yes. with an instrument of course Frederick the Great in Berlin was yeah. a flute player himself and I think one of the things about this organ is really that flute sound is extremely yeah. special on the on the root positive of course there's a four foot flat deuce as well So why don't we now listen to something a little bit more, uh, some of the, of the kind of colourful side, and try the viola de gamba oh, on, yes. the, on the help back, and we could perhaps have the oboe on the yes. positive, and listen back and forth. So the viola de gamba is that very narrow scale, noisy. <laughs> I wonder whether we can hear something in the pedal. What do you think, Matthew? Yes. I mean, maybe maybe the first sort of uh, the most special pedal stop perhaps is that oh, two that's foot knuckle. Yeah. Very unusual. Um, you think the pedal is very low and big and powerful, but here, of course, this beautiful two foot flute. We could contrast that, of course, with the reeds in yeah. the pedal. Should we just put them all on? This is quite an unusual aspect of this <laughs> instrument. Yes. 16 well, do foot them, do, reeds. Do them in series. Okay, so we've got the 16 foot Pugana. Um, 
And if we add the, the principal chorus also, the, both the mixtures, and the, I need to add the Rausch Pfeiffer as well in there, and maybe take the two foot off, and yeah. we can hear what the North German pedal says. <laughs> The full plenum to that. Yeah. So principal eight four mixture in the half back. Maybe add the sixteen foot quintadena. Yeah. And should we add the trumpet as well? Yeah. And then on the Rufus teeth principal eight four two. And let's just use the sharp, yeah. the very bright, bright, biting mixture in the rook positive teeth. You'll hear that first. Fantastic. Mm. If I could summarize, shall, shall I just yeah. say a final word? I think what you hear here is extraordinary power, extraordinary beauty, and a tremendous idiosyncrasy in the sound. And perhaps that goes to Muni Tucker's great aesthetic, that the hand of the maker should be always visible in, in the artwork. So there's, there are impurities, there are, there are wonderful quaverings in the wind, there are aspects of the sound which are idiosyncratic, and the whole total is a tremendous mechanical object, but also an extraordinary work of art. And it's just so exciting to come and play here. So everyone is invited. Mm -hmm.